order and to begin we'd like to respectfully acknowledge that this morning's meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Wasanic First Nations. Can I look for a motion to adopt today's agenda as presented? Thank you. Second. All in favor. Kumbaya. Excellent. And we can have a motion to adopt the minutes from our March 20th meeting. Thank you. Second. All in favor. All right. So let's jump right into old business. Talk a little bit about our senior care facility update and an exercise. A drill was held on May 2nd. I was uh, out of town, but I understand it was very well attended and beneficial. Um, we did have a pretty fulsome debrief at the uh, CSB last week, and I'll, uh, I'll defer to Mike and Donna to provide a bit of a, a brief overview of the event. Thank you. Yeah, May 22nd, uh, 10.30 in the morning, we had uh, 60 actors from Beacon Community Services and Parkland School and uh, had all seven facilities involved, uh, as well as external partners. So we had BC Transit involved, the PMO ESS and SAR team, and uh, the RCMP. And uh, we simulated a uh, fire in Rest Haven Lodge. And then we let their staff go through the motions of what an evacuation would look like and something like that. So once we started the exercise, we made the call to uh, BC Transit, who is already staged in Sydney. Um, we got a bus uh, close by the front entrance and we made that kind of our temporary uh, refuge spot to give all of the evacuees somewhere to be and contained. Um, and really it was for the facilities just to identify the work they have. Because this was an exercise where they knew it was happening and they upstaffed, um, but we, we could have these same problems present uh, in the evening hours where staffing is quite minimal. Um, and then, yeah, as the chief said, we had a, a great debrief last week uh, looking at standardized uh, cards for all the residents when they leave, because right now we're kind of all over the map. Some have pictures, some have names, some have, you know, dietary restric restrictions. Um, so it was great to get them around the table and work on kind of common language and common goals. So uh, I think the biggest takeaway was the facilities themselves. We're just super grateful that the uh, time that we put in to host and facilitate something like this so that they can exercise what it looks like for their facilities. So. This year we did uh, complex care and uh, there's already an interest to do one next year with uh, the independent folks. So we're already looking at something like that for next year. So, but very positive and a great success. Right, Donna, do you have any? Um, I think just what was kind of new this year is we had Health BC there as well and they were a really good resource just to be um, connecting everyone when we talked about standardizing protocols and such. They I think having that person in the room and making that connection face to face and everyone feeling like they're approachable and not this kind of foreign entity was really helpful. And they had a lot of good ideas and willing to support. So that was kind of new for that group, which was really good this year. Do you think we could do this in town talk? Definitely, we could do something. Okay, yeah. I feel like it's really cool. Like it seems to me like you have to be a pretty coordinated fire department to be running. Um, you know, drills like this and so valuable when you mentioned like, well, you can evacuate someone, but what if you don't know what medication they need or what to avoid like that? You're hitting on all those things that could just be lost in a chaotic situation if you hadn't prepped in advance. We can definitely do a story. The one, the one takeaway that we always hear is these people have worked in other municipalities and they just don't have the level of support that, yeah. that we commit. So we meet yeah. three or four times a year and we try and do an exercise like this once a year. So That's highly beneficial. So do you actually physically evacuate uh, people and get them into the bus or is it just all the prep? No. So this was, we had 30 acting students from Parklands and then we had 30 volunteers and they were all given kind of a script. So here's your age, here's your gender and here's, you know, okay, you're, I get it. Okay. you're aggressive, you're a wanderer, you're, you know, we actually had one of the students from Parklands on the bus and figured out how to pop the emergency window out. <laughs> and next thing you know, they were walking up Mills Road. So, so it didn't actually involve the existing residents. No, those residents, you know, they don't have the capacity to be involved in something like that. Okay. So Great. the acting jumps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. problem is they're not acting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, and now I'll I'll we'll stay with uh, Deputy Herman and, and Don and we'll give a bit of a, an update on our fire smart grant status and like that. Yeah, so just uh we did secure just shy of $60,000 for a FireSmart grant. 
uh, we put out to tender uh, looking for a consultant to work on our community wildfire resiliency plan. And we were successful in uh, contracting Diamond Head Consulting. Don and I had our initial kickoff meeting uh, two weeks ago. And it sounds very positive that uh, they're going to do some work through the summer and probably have their first big engagement with us in September. And uh, really, that's going to build a plan and highlight the areas in Sydney and the potential uh, risks and concerns and how we can prepare ourselves to be resilient should we have something in one of the neighboring municipalities where the risk is a lot greater than what we have in Sydney. Well, thanks, Mike. And we'll, we'll add that with our, um, our our new to us type five wildland engine, which we, we brought back from Arizona last year, um, we are going to be doing a simulated grass fire in, in Peter Grant Park uh, via practice. We'll be driving in the end of Green Blade Road, actually driving on the trail and actually taking that uh, that truck in there and doing a, a zip a simulated grass fire. And the whole idea would be is to you know suppress that grass fire before it got into the actual trees and the like that would you know threaten potentially summer gate in that kind of neighborhood in there. So it's pretty green, it's pretty lush, it's still pretty wet in there, but the the chance for you know, I'll rank one or two grass fire in that big open space is, is very much real. So we're going to practice that. We don't have a hard date set, but it'll be sometime this summer. And we'll, we'll do that. So, and we'll communicate that as well. Yeah, I was wondering, is there like a time where this, when it comes before council, is there like a moment of where it's public that would make sense to do extra communications? Once we get the, uh, the wildfire resiliency plan that's likely going to be february we'll have the final okay and then part of their uh, contracting services to present to council mm -hmm. and their finance. Nice. okay so, yeah. i feel like when that wildfire happened at north sandwich um yeah. like i i didn't think the photos that were on social media were appropriate really like it was someone's burned down house the day after their house burned down like yeah. all over social media but still i think it got a lot of people thinking like what could happen in sydney if we get like if there's a huge <laughs> forest fire happening at our doorstep and people I think would be really interested in knowing some of what yeah. comes into this exercise. And in our first meeting with Diamond Head, that was one of our concerns was if you look around Sydney, you know, we don't have large, you know, forested areas where we're concerned. We do have some, but mm -hmm. the biggest risk for us is, you know, the Horth Hill areas, the Dean Park areas, if something was to go there, how can we best prepare Sydney yeah. uh, in a defense plan? So having that first conversation with them, we'll get them over here and hopefully, you know, their findings will shed some light on what we can do here to be more prepared. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're fortunate having built structure defense plans for communities in the interior. It's <clears throat> kind of what I do. It's uh, we're in good shape. It's going to be nice to actually have a independent third party plan. Okay. It's largely going to be for be some select areas as well in a large scale event. I mean, there could be ember cast from places. Ember cast can go as far as a kilometer under the right conditions that can start fires. So more of an awareness thing. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't Sydney Fire Department sharing those photos. Yeah. That I didn't oh, no, we wouldn't do that. You know, you guys don't. Um, it's just it created a public awareness that I think now it's on people's minds a bit. And the big thing with getting the Community Wildfire Resiliency Plan completed this year is it's going to allow us for future uh, funding in that wildfire. So if there is, you know, defense items that we can get, mm -hmm. sprinkler systems and stuff like that, this is kind of the first step for future funding. So perfect. <laughs> Now, Donna, I think it might be appropriate. Um, we didn't get it on as a late item on the whole business, but you um, wanted to speak about the 2024 EOC grant status. Yeah, we had discussed it at our last meeting, and at that point it was just pending if we were getting approval, and we were successful in that grant. So we obtained a $30,000 grant for EOC training. So the idea is we will hopefully do more EOC training with staff, and we have till March 2025 to do that. So just to confirm it, we were successful. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I know that this warms everybody's heart on this table. With more GOC training. Well, yeah, and I think we're going to look at doing the training in 2025. Exactly, but, that's uh, the intent. Mm -hmm. We have bought some uh, some storage and stuff like that to properly rack stuff in the EOC room, so it's going to be better organized. Mm -hmm. And then just working with Will in IT to purchase a couple extra laptops and stuff to bolster the capacity in there. So, does mm -hmm. that uh, training cover staff time? It does, does not. Sure. We'll just jump ahead to uh, our disaster water supply project. It's underway. Uh, the planning continues, but uh, 
time to focus on the, this project is, is kind of limited right now, uh, but we'll continue to provide updates wherever I haven't invested a lot of time in the last month or so, but I'm hoping to clear my desk and kind of dive back in in the next couple of weeks once we clear a few things off. So that's where we stand there. Uh, the Town of Sydney Boy Data Collection and Flood Mapping Project, as well, and I'll loop in our Flood Risk Community Education Grant opportunity. And I know Kira would love to update us on those. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so the buoy data collection uh, component task A of the project wrapped up uh, last week. Uh, so I think they just sent us a report on that data. Um, and so that's exciting. And then that will kind of lead into task B, which is now in the process of ramping up, which is uh, the modeling and mapping refinement component of the project. So yeah, task B, um, which will kind of take what the, the CRD came out for us in 2021 with the, the transects saying like, this is flood construction level kind of numbers at different parts along the waterfront. And so we're going from nine to 22 along the waterfront is kind of the the goal of this. So we have more kind of granular numbers for um, what the flood risk looks like here, um, which should be com aiming to complete it like early spring, kind of late Q1, I believe, for um, the modeling and mapping refinement piece. Um, this task C is the public education component. Um, if our flood hazard signs up on the waterfront, thank you, Brian. Um, saw those yesterday at my run. Um, the first round of presentations were done uh, with myself, Donna, and Brett, which were very big success, really big turnout, kind of unexpectedly. <laughs> um, but we're happy to see that. And we just did a recording of the presentation as well last week. So um, planning to make that available on the website so people who didn't make it out can watch it. Um, but there are more presentations planned for the fall and spring in person so people can ask questions and come up to that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I was able to make connection with SEO First Nation as well. Um, part of the project was to collaborate with First Nations, um, and uh, we're looking to be able to provide data to them from the, the buoy data collection element uh, for their use, for their sea level rise and just flood planning purposes, um, and potentially uh, incorporating some artwork into some interpretive signs from the grant application. And yeah, those are kind of the key components there. I was gonna do the other grant at the round table, but happy to speak to it now as well. Um, just got, uh, it came out, it's the Local Leadership for Climate Adaptation, Adaptation in Action Grant, and the Implementation Project Stream just came out about two weeks ago from the federal FCM, uh, Cambridgeship, FCM stands for again. Federation. Canadian Municipality, so that's the one. Um, so looking at applying for that grant for a kind of a community climate risk resilience project, uh, had some conversations with one of their uh, grant advisors with the, the program last week. Ended up chatting for almost two hours with him about the project. And so looking at kind of two elements, um, looking at our two main climate risks, so flood risk and heat risk. So looking at um, potentially putting out an RFP uh, to do flood home protection assessments um, funded by the, the grant so that can help people with their, their properties um, increase their, help them identify where they have flood risk and kind of have some practical actions for how they can reduce their flood risk. And then part two being um, some like, heat resilience, uh, looking at putting in kind of misting stations, the water bottle fill and drinking fountains stations, um, looking at potentially six sites uh, in Sydney parks. So just been working with engineering on um, kind of getting cost estimates for that to go into the grant application um, in terms of servicing and so on. So yeah, it would be, the grant application is due August 14th. Um, relatively quick turnaround, but um, yeah, it covers up to a million dollars starting at 60% cost coverage. And then you can have up to 100% based on other factors if you kind of meet certain criteria. Um, so hoping to get up to 80% coverage, um, but yeah, so that'll be exciting. Money has to be spent, I believe in, in two years. So yeah. 
that's the summary there. Thank you, Kira. And just the kind of the how-to video that uh, yourself and, and Donna and I did included in that was how to utilize the CRD Capital Region uh, Tsunami Information Portal. So we'll have a kind of a separate link in that video and we'll post that because that was one of our our deliverables that's kind of been outstanding for a while. So we included that and that'll be parsed off and we'll make that available through our various mm -hmm. sites. So that'll be that'll be complete, which will be nice. So um, one last grant to speak to. It's nothing disasters are, are very good for the grant environment these days. It seems <laughs> our ESS grant, Mr. Hartman, if you could speak to that. Yeah, so ESS we were uh but another $30,000 grant. So out of that fund there, we purchased uh, additional laptops and printers for more of a mobile response. So if they have to leave the CSB and set up uh, in the trailer that's now mobile and operational, uh, they'll have that capacity to work off site. Um, we managed to send our director and one member to a, a ESS conference in, uh, in Kamloops, which uh, when we look at the other big piece for the grant was recruit and retention. Um, that did great things for us, for the director. You know, these people are putting in countless hours of volunteer work. So the small little things we can do for them, keep them moving forward. And uh, like I say, the ESS team right now is thriving pretty good with, you know, between 12 and 15 people, you know, kind of always around the meeting we had on Monday night, we had 12 people there. So it's, uh, it's really good. And uh, I think they feel the support from our program here. So just keep supporting them and making them available. So I think we had three people out just a couple of weeks ago for the fire in our Saanich. So yeah, so we looked after the folks there. I, I would just echo that um, <clears throat> really the service they provide now is so seamless. It used to be a bit of a, a bit of a process, but now the, the team is so well organized and well supported and engaged. It's simply one phone call. And then they look after it. They've engaged the displaced residents. They've made sure that they have a place to stay, whether it's uh, vouchers for uh, you know, different lodging in a different place or uh, clothes or food or all these things. It's just looked after seamlessly. I think I checked in on the status of, of where it was for that call in North Sanders like three or four hours later. And they were all done, dusted, back in bed. And I think I woke them up just to get an update. They're like, oh, it's all looked after. Everyone's, it's done. It's, so it's, it's, it's working very, very well. We're very fortunate. So mm -hmm. happy. Any other old business before we jump to new business? No, I can't like fill town talk up with this content, but would you ever see it being value in like profiling a volunteer? Because I find the work they do is quite touching. Like I remember when people were evacuated from the Star Center, the Cameo building, it's like, all the things they don't have to think about because someone else is taking care of their needs during that critical moment. Like, would that ever be satisfying for a volunteer to get recognition like that? I think it would be great recognition, you know, especially somebody like, you know, our ESS director who, you know, she's helping build the plan. She's constantly in the office doing work. Uh, she's trying to keep up with the changes that EMCR are implementing with ESS from, you know, going from paper copies to everything's online to now they're actually sending e-transfers to um people that are evacuated so mm -hmm. if we could do a small little kind of highlight of you know somebody like her i think that would be great maybe Just that could be like the profile because we often do a staff profile but we'll go externally sometimes and do like jennifer van s with the shoal center so maybe that would work. sure i think it'd be great yeah yep um yeah i, I just had a comment i just wanted to follow up on something uh, the laptops that mike mentioned were purchased recently with the grant um, thank you for uh, for working with IT and Pimo and the CSB on that because it wasn't just a couple of laptops. Um, we now have a new smoke and fast laptop for each one of those uh, tables uh, at the stations for the OC, and we have the existing ones to add multiple uh, laptops there for training when we have more people there, and we got more for Pimo as well, and they're going to benefit the CSB. So. You know, a lot of times people will purchase stuff and don't always take into consideration the consequences and the support and all the stuff that goes along with that decision. But you guys made it a, a logical purchase and coordinated a couple different budgets and time things so that it's it's really going to make a big difference for a few years now. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. That's local government at work right there. So well done.
no, no, thank you for that. It was, it was, it was easy. So, um, on new business uh, tonight, I know some uh, elected officials, and, and I'll be there, and a few others. It's our um, actual our PMO appreciation. We have a barbecue, so we recognize that the PMO volunteers. I know there'll be a, a number of elected officials from the three municipalities there. And we give out long service awards. And again, it's just another opportunity just to, to recognize the, the hard work and dedication. So that occurs tonight at the CSB at five o'clock. So that uh, we'll look forward to that. And um, we'll look at, I don't know, Donna, if you can put it up on the screen, but just a semi, uh, we're halfway through the year approximately. And we just want to look at kind of a, where we are. We targeted um, approximately eight goals for the emergency planning committee. Um, provide a bit of a snapshot of where we are and a lot of things are in progress or complete approximately about half are complete and the other are in progress but um, we, we are making good progress I'm, I'm happy and I, I think having a slightly less um, enthusiastic list this year is, is more realistic and we'll be able to to knock them off or you know make really good progress on on the list that we did identify so see if this there we go. I think we need to get one of those Greg super fast laptops in here. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that would help. Sorry. Oh, here. Oh, there we go. Right, so uh, 2024. So obviously we have completed the first one. That was the large nursing home, um, and it was done on the 22nd. Uh, the Meet Your Street um, program and guide that is going to be linked to our um, one of our new career hires who will be starting probably in the next 30 to 45 days. So that's, that's in the process. Um, we have, uh, well, we are underway and it was approved by council our disaster water supply. So we have a project charter and we're working with a, we awarded a consultant to look at the requirements there. So that is underway. Um, our, we have also engaged that same consultant about updating our hazard specific response plans. Um, we're, I've yet to uh, receive a reply. So that's kind of in progress. Again, the United Nations Resilient Hub relies on a lot of these other things being completed. So it, it, there's definitely a link there. Okay. Our, yes. I think one of the easier is we need to reevaluate our uh, goal of being that resilient hub city because the scope of that program has changed so much since I know. Inception, that I don't think it, it makes sense for our organization. And that's a, that's a fair comment. I think, you know, next year we'll look at that and see if we're close or if it's, we'll just punt one or the other. It's no longer something that emergency management on their own. It's an organization wide and even something that exceeds our organizational capacity in terms of certain economic resiliencies that are beyond our scope. No, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I don't like giving up on things, but I don't disagree. So no, we'll, changed. Yeah. it's not the same goal that we had at the outset. It's not that's nearly as simple as it was uh, seven years ago when it was first raised. No, that. Again, fair comment, and I think next year we'll we sit around this table. I think in January, the first meeting, we'll, we can have that discussion. Uh, our sea level rise public education components, that and the next one are linked, and those are complete. And uh, we've already spoken to where we are in respect to our community wildfire resiliency plan, and um, the deliverables of that will obviously go to council as well as to the public. So a lot of those things are in place. So we're making we are making some good progress, so we're happy with that. Um, the next thing we have is just a quick snapshot update on fire department call volume. The last previous two years, we've seen unheard of increases in call volume of like 23 and 25 percent year over year. I'm, I'm happy to report that we're not we're not trending in that direction this year. We're we're probably falling back into what I would consider a a normal. Um, call volume where we're probably five to six percent ahead of where we were last year which i would expect to be normal um, would be nice if we were five or six percent less but um we are about we're trending probably five or six percent above where we were at this time last year which again is is manageable and, and to be expected so I'm, I'm happy that we're not 
you know, into the into the big time double digit uh, increases because that wouldn't have been sustainable as we're configured. But five percent is something we can definitely absorb and and, and continue on. So, are those are those, are those incre <coughs> Excuse me. Are those increases in medical calls or fire and safety across the board? They're evenly spaced. Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. And again, a lot of it is is kind of you'll see little seasonal bumps. Um, this is the time of year where we, we realize a, a pretty a larger influx of un, unsheltered folks that come into the town and there can be a, a bump associated with with them as well. Um, and then it all depends if we get into a, a long stretch of hot weather um, that can drive call volume as well. So it, it all it all depends. But I haven't seen, a, you know, a disproportionately high number of, of medical calls versus this time last year. Um, I would say the ambulance service is as understaffed or as challenged as it was this time last year. I don't think they've um, their service hasn't been degraded, uh, but it hasn't improved significantly either. So we're pretty much where we were. The, re the reason I ask is that there's a movement underway at UBCM, as there has been for quite some time, but it seems to be gaining some momentum of pushing the province to try and compensate municipalities for this extra work that fire departments do in responding to medical calls. Yes. So uh, it would just be interesting if we could somehow quantify the uh, the load, let's say, that medical calls have and how that's affecting uh, resources. And well, we did, we did a, a deep analysis of the stats uh, at the end of last year, which you saw at budget time. Mm -hmm. So we should do that uh, at least annually, maybe more frequently. Not just what the calls are, but when they are. Give us more. No, absolutely. And the fortunate to uh, being with Surrey Dispatch, the the data that we can mine it can be very very granular. Um, sitting on the fire chiefs committee, one of two chiefs that that kind of represent um, intergovernment relations between. EMA licensing, the fire chiefs and the province themselves, I can state that the province will go, it's very clearly that the first responder program is, is discretionary. We're not obligated to participate in any way, shape or form. And if you do not want to participate, you can just remove that service. Of course, that's easy to say um, when someone's unconscious on the sidewalk on Beacon and they're trying to clear an ambulance from Royal Jubilee Hospital and you have firefighters sitting in the CSB, that's not something that you or I want to uh, defend in a council meeting. So it, it really, they put us in a difficult spot, but that's what they'll throw back at us because it's not a, it's an opt-in, opt-out. It's not a requirement. Um, but nobody ever <laughs> went to the trouble of seeing what it would be like if all the fire departments across the province decided to- Yes, very much so. They X unilaterally withdraw their their services for medical calls, there would be a public outcry the likes of which is never seen. Absolutely. And I know that Vancouver has tried and then really that I hate to say it, that the departments that are going to really move the needle or is, is not going to be Sydney, but it's going to be Surrey and Vancouver and, and Richmond. And I there are some things happening there and I hopefully we can kind of ride on their coattails and get a little bit of offset. So unfortunately that dates back to 2006. Oh, I don't doubt it. Yes. Uh, I happen to have been involved in that in those days, and it's an ongoing struggle. Very much so. Very much so. Um, yeah, they have in increased our scope of training uh, with some associated costs, but we are able to provide a higher level of service now, which is, is making a pretty significant difference, which we're happy to do. So um, I don't have anything else. Well, I will throw out is this done. Um, we'll Jump into roundtable now, and I think it'd be a good opportunity. I'll start it off. Um, just if there's any feedback specific to um, safety and emergency preparedness in relation to the the market and the new market operator, I've had nothing but you know we've had a little issue here, a little issue there, but the market organizer or facilitator has been very receptive, managed to make small changes on the fly. Um, have no real complaints from our perspective. I don't know if the RCMP is how things are going pretty smoothly as well. Pretty smoothly. Yeah. And and Jen, your folks are, are happy, right? Yeah. It's to be expected. 
but but all in all, I think they're very amenable, agreeable to deal with. You know, we pick up the phone, make a phone call. They're it's they're, they seem to be very professional. So I have no complaints. I just didn't know if there was any other any thoughts or no complaints are a good thing. Brian, you're happy. Yeah, so far so good. It's just the, their capacity sometimes is limited, but you know, we're working the best we can. Very good. There was um not related to the market, but um, I'd heard there was a, a subsequent discussion regarding um, the Victoria seventy point three and Ironman, and sort of the lack of uh, yes, the lack of notice and the lack of approvals that uh, were received um, by the various uh, municipalities and organizations that uh, were involved in uh, in that particular event. And do you know what the outcome of that maybe was, Jen? Was there um, and was that passed along to 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 the organization, Tyron So the district of Saanich kind of led this um, the meeting that happened. Um, Steve from the town's uh, engineering department mm -hmm. attended. Um, Sydney wasn't as impacted as like Saanich was. They had some significant traffic problems on their streets. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I know Saanich's uh, like police department was there. Um, I don't don't think there was a need for. RCMP to necessarily be there. I don't think there was as many issues as there were down um, closer to the core. But but yeah, the the discussion was to make a more um, for the large events that travel through multiple jurisdictions to have just like one application form for all the mm -hmm. municipalities, um, so that every municipality gets the same information. I guess so. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, we found out about the event because uh, Mike Harmon uh, notified us about it about. Tuesday before it happened. How did you find out? You know, I just saw it on social media. Yeah. Saw somebody post uh, about a traffic disruption the following weekend. Yeah. So I think the only municipality they actually applied to was Sandwich um, in advance. They didn't, there were new organizers and they didn't realize they had to contact all the other municipalities as well. Um, so anyway, um, in the end, it, Sandwich is looking to change their route potentially um, to minimize some of the impact that it's having on some of their roads. Again, I don't think we felt the same impact here in mm -hmm. Sydney. Um, we have it kind of dialed in how they how they uh, operate it. And it's on a Sunday morning, so it's less traffic um, than other times. But uh, we'll definitely make sure um, Christy attends those meetings and uh, cool. um, just making sure they they follow the right procedures and it's the best outcome for all the municipalities. No, for sure, that's great. Yeah. Well, thanks. We did yeah. manage to get the, the required duty crew and. They've been invoiced for that, I'm sure, and yeah, that'll all be that's part the of the deal. Was beneficial to have, but we did a major accident that morning. So, yeah, like I say, with roads being closed, impacting volunteers getting to the hall, mm. uh, it paid off dividends having an extra truck on. So that's good. Sometimes it works. Yeah. Any other roundtable items, Mr. Hissick? The session last week focused on the uh, urgency. You and enhanced, and I think we're all aware something came out. We're not aware of huge implications to have over the we have to, even though we've done a pretty good job here, I think it's been greatly expanded. But more responsibility, we'll see a lot more reporting. That's why I think it's important to clear our table of all the nice to haves and knowing that we're going to be focusing on this stuff, including the Indigenous engagement portion. Yes, Donna is scheduled to attend on our behalf. And love, we'd love to have a Comox coming up. It's exciting. July. In July, there you go. No, I, I agree. And I, I would say it's just not um, emergency response. I know that the Fire service they're either abolishing, I believe, or is the process of the Fire Services Act is being, I think it's going to go before um, the legislature here pretty quick and receive three readings and it'll be changed. And a lot of the things that were in the act in respect to uh, provincial legislations are now going to be downloaded um, onto individual municipalities in the form of of fire rig back to fire regulating bylaws mm -hmm. and it'll be encoded in in bylaws or MTI. So a lot of again, much more kind of downloading and, mm -hmm. and work to us. 
So I again, I agree with you wholeheartedly. So there's a theme of it. Yeah, the downloading. <laughs> the unofficial theme, all, all the different ways of. Well, you know how I like the candy coat thing. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I think that's consistent. You know, thank you for that. And yes. Um, I also went to a session that related to emergency planning last week, but it focused on communications. And I don't know when would be the best time to take a look at some of the takeaways from it, but I found it really interesting, like um, making sure your website has search capacity in an emergency. And I don't know if our, I mean, Greg could help with that, but I don't know if our new website, how well it would handle a huge influx in the use all of a sudden. Um, making sure if you're a comms team of one that you you know how to grow your team, like there's people like I work with and Kira who are excellent at communications, like making sure you have that. You're looking at community group lists in their update, you know, in terms of people who lead churches or work, that kind of thing that I think you're probably already on a lot of it. But um, it was interesting to me and a lot of good tips. So I, I don't know where the best venue is to kind of touch on some of those takeaways, but I um, would love to put them to use. Well, definitely we can have a conversation and as much as everyone not now really excited about it but actually you know EOC mm -hmm. training where some of that gets vetted and you actually work through a few scenarios mm -hmm. and having done the large you know EOC for months we really built our capacity with you know it was prior to, to you coming on the team but whether it was Donna or Krista and oh, all gosh, and all these other people that now have experience and you know, we have pre-canned messages mm -hmm. for social media built into our hazard-specific response plans, mm -hmm. but it's through those training sessions that we kind of build that out and identify that, oh, we have a gap there, or we can put that in, yeah. and those type of things. So there is value there, but yeah. Yeah, we're open to any anything okay. like that. Yeah, thank you. And I would just add, um, it's something that Chief Tweed Hope was really always pushed before, before I was chief, and I, I really think it was important is when town staff get the opportunity to deploy whether it's you know the rcmp going to you know a fire in the interior or mike and i going and working in eocs or as incident commanders in the interior or anybody else the experience and insights you you gain from you know you go into burns lake or that regional district and you understand what they have what they don't have what we have and then you can kind of bring that back. You can't you can't buy that experience. Mm -hmm. And it's really important. And I really think organizationally, if we can, we never have time to send anyone away. But that experience is so valuable on the back end. Mm -hmm. The ability to deploy people and expose them to that is pays. It's paid huge dividends for us um, over the years. And I think it's something we need to continue to support as much as it's not easy to let people go because. Disasters always in the middle of the summer, and everyone's on holidays, and we have no staff, and, and all that's valid. But it, it really pays off in in the end. So I think organizationally, that's something that we need to remain cognizant of for sure. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else. Is there any other roundtable items, Mr. Hum? Yeah. So I just wanted to. Uh, this is a week of last for me, and this is my last uh, EPC meeting. So I just wanted to. Uh, Knowledge uh, the leadership uh, of uh, Chief from Chief Nicholson and uh, Deputy Harmon and Donna. Thank you very much for the work you've done, and to the committee members. You know, emergency planning is uh, one of those things. It's a legislated requirement to have uh, to have an EPC. Um, you're always future planning, uh, looking at future scenarios, etc. Never knowing if. Uh, you know something is gonna you know happen and what's gonna be ahead of you. So it's a lot of what ifs, and uh, so commitment of the group is is truly appreciated. So yeah, just wanted to say thanks. Well, I'm sure on behalf of the group, I'd like to thank thank Randy for your support for this group and and your leadership during the COVID pandemic. It was it was fun to uh, see you there every morning and still the PTSD of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll see you I know. Yeah, I know. I know. We, we, uh, was it trip? Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. You write that in your consulting memoirs. There you go. Up there. So, but anyways, that's, uh, it's all it's all good stuff. Other than that, I'll just uh, stay up for a great summer. Our next meeting is September 18th. One has anything else? Look for Randy. We'll give you a Zoom invite. But if you don't have anything exciting going on at that time, you can join us for giggles. And I'll look for a, a motion to adjourn. All right, thank you very much.